want you to know it was 39 years ago at this very hotel in this ballroom that we gathered for the inaugural IFF Legislative Conference. And just as we've done 38 times before, today we come together to do the important work on behalf of our members and their future. But let me start by recognizing the efforts of our incredible, incredible leadership, your union's tremendous team. It starts with our General Secretary Treasurer, my union partner, Ed Kelly, who is a terrific leader. He's doing a fantastic job. He's managing your $72 million, finding innovative ways and creative solutions to give us the most for the money our members pony up so we can continue to provide the critical services and resources you've come to expect from this IAFF. I am proud to stand alongside him, and you should be proud to have him as your principal officer. Ed, thank you for everything you do for this IFF. And to our executive board, 16 vice presidents, each the very best from our 16 districts. They're the ones that fill your chair. They're your voice at the leadership table. It's an incredible group who makes sure that our members are our top priority as we establish our mission and goals and create the next set of tools for you, our affiliate leadership. Yes, I've been around a while, and I've had the privilege to serve with many boards over my time. But there is little doubt that this is one of the very best. In fact, I believe it is the very best executive board this union has ever had. So thank you to all of our vice presidents, our executive board, for all the work you do on behalf of this IAFF. And in order to make sure that we're following the policies, to make sure the books are straight, to make sure that we're providing you the financial information with great transparency. I also want to thank our trustees for the work they do. The Constitution provides them with the responsibility, and it's on your behalf that they work to make sure that your union is operating at the very highest level. To our trustees in Canada, and here on the floor today, thank you for all you do for this IFF. Thank you. I also want to recognize our dedicated staff across all of our divisions, all of our departments, for all of their hard work. This is an incredible group of some of the very best in each of their disciplines. And the ones that put our priorities and vision to work they're the ones that take the, the missions and the goals and develop the cutting-edge programs across this entire international. And to our political and legislative staff, I'll tell you, they're the ones who developed this conference today. They coordinate and support local leaders in their campaigns out in the field. They're the ones who uh, are in the congressional offices lobbying on your behalf all year long. They're navigating the complex federal administration to make sure our interests are addressed when the laws and are adopted and the standards and rules are written. So I want to thank you, Dave, and Shannon, Andy, and our entire political and legislative staff. Incredible work on behalf of this IFF. Thank you, gang. And to all of you, our affiliate leadership, the important work you'll be doing tomorrow during your visits on the Hill, and the relationships, maybe even more important, that you'll create here, and you'll create them back home with your representatives and senators, as well as their staff, that's what's going to make the difference for our 316,000 members that we're all privileged to represent. Your work at this conference over the years has helped to pass important legislation over time, enabling $8.5 billion in the FIRE Act to provide resources so that fire departments have the best turnouts, equipment, and apparatus for our members to do their tough job. And the $4.2 billion in SAFER Act funding that helped keep 14,000 of our own 
keep their jobs and bring those that lost their jobs back to work and make sure that we have enough of them on the rigs to, to do that job safely and effectively. You've helped provide the $343,000 in PSOB benefits for the families of our fallen brothers and sisters. It was your work that helped to extend the Fair Labor Standards Act that has provided hundreds of billions of dollars in overtime pay to our members over these years. And yes, your work on the Zadroga Act, which provides much needed health care benefits for those in our ranks that are battling illness and disease from their work in the aftermath of the horrific 9-11 attacks. You've helped us develop national standards and regulations to keep our members safe on the job. And most recently, your efforts here in our nation's capital at a time of nasty partisan divide, bitterness and rancor between the Congress and the administration, when little is getting passed, it was your work that helped us pass through the Firefighter Cancer Registry that will record information about firefighters with cancers so that we can better understand the prevalence and the impact of this dreaded disease in our profession that is devastating the lives and careers of so many of our brothers and sisters. And we accomplished all of this by getting broad bipartisan support and following one constant rule that we have to work both sides of the political aisle, supporting those that support us, knowing that this philosophy will def definitely help save our members' lives. And so as we approach another political season, we once again take note that our membership, and you know our membership, they are politically diverse. They represent the landscape and the political spectrum of our nation. They have their own political allegiances, and they have their own political preferences. And they have varied ideologies and philosophical ideas. Within our ranks, there are many different personal views on social issues and mixed feelings about how our government should run. And yes, many question whether we should be involved in politics at all. But as this union's leaders, we have to stay true to our mission. We have to make sure that we're representing their interests. We have to make the tough decisions that sometimes flies in their face and support candidates, regardless of the, our members' individual interests, livelihoods, rights, and to ensure their financial success. These are the decision makers that have the power to determine if our members stay safe and healthy on the job. These are the ones that come out of the political arena that will determine whether they receive a fair day's pay. And they'll be, will they be afforded a secure retirement after spending a career saving lives? So there's really no choice. We have to be involved. And we have to decide who gets to hold that power. It can't matter which side of the philosophical aisle someone's on. The only thing that matters for this union it's the political work that decides, are you on our side of the issue? We can't afford to play one-sided partisan politics, and some do that. But we can't get caught up in partisan politics. We can't get sidetracked with identity politics. We don't have a blind allegiance to one party. And as you'll see with our speakers today, we must and maintain friends on both sides of the political aisle as long as they support our members and this union's future. We'll support Republicans, Democrats, as well as independents. Always stay in focus on one thing, bridging the political divide that exists to address the issues that protects our members' interests. So you're going to hear from speakers today from various backgrounds and party affiliations, but they'll have one thing in common, and that's their support for the women and men of this IAFF. Secretary Chow isn't going to be here simply because she's a Secretary of Transportation. She's here because of her work with this union to make our members safer when it comes to hazmat transport and placarding, helping us with the additional training dollars we need. She's always been a friend, always standing for our interests. Democratic Representative Dan Kildee and Republican Brian Fitzpatrick will be here today, who've taken the lead on passing our national collective bargaining bill. And Democrat Bobby Scott is the 
powerful new chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, the very committee which will be considering and moving the Cooperation Act. We'll hear from Mayor Francis Suarez, who our local didn't support in his first election, but now has their full support because of his work and support of our local in Miami, Florida. And we also have two longtime friends with us today, one from the Senate and the other from the House, both in leadership. Senator Chuck Schumer, the U.S. Senate Minority Leader, and Steny Hoyer, the Majority Leader of the House. Our relationship with both of them goes a long way back. And it's as solid today as it ever was. The key is that all of these leaders coming to address you represent a solid relationship, each one a shining example of what working in a bipartisan manner can accomplish. But yet, even with these friends in important places, we still face potential challenges, challenges like the recent Supreme Court decision on Janus. Now, the media and the political elites were predicting a mass exodus of members from all public sector labor unions. But this IAFF didn't listen to those prognosticators. We didn't play dead. We didn't roll over. What did we do? We just continued our longstanding efforts to communicate with our members, showing them the value of being a part of our great union. And we divide the conventional wisdom. We continued adding new members virtually every month for the last several years because we constantly show the value of belonging to this IAFF. And you should be proud of it. And that's what's helped us build our powerful political gold and black brand, a brand that's so much more than just rich contrasting colors. It's the brand that represents the best this nation has to offer. And that best is our members and the work they do in their communities and neighborhoods. It represents what this union stands for, standing up for what is right at the local, state, provincial, and the federal levels in our two countries. People recognize that brand and recognize that it represents one of the most politically powerful unions in the United States and Canada, this IAFF. And I'll tell you what, I am so damn proud of this union, I am so damn proud of you, and I hope you feel the same way. We have got a great union, this IAFF. <laughs> when it comes to strength, we've got it. We may not be the largest union in terms of overall membership, but we're a powerhouse that punches way above our weight class. And FirePak is the adrenaline that fuels our ability to deliver that blow. And with the support of you, our local leaders, our members have grown more and more into understanding the importance of FirePAC and helping to turn it into one of the largest federal PACs in this country. It's allowed us to help candidates financially, big time, but it also delivers vital services like technical assistance to campaigns, giving our candidates and ballots a better chance of success. With services like E18 Productions and our strategic campaign operation that's second to none, we have the ability to win. We're not just writing checks and wearing t-shirts. We're out there in the trenches making sure that the message of our supported candidates is heard loud and clear. And with fire pack per capita increases that were passed by the delegates at our centennial convention last August, we're going to be able to do so much more. So to the hundreds of you, our local leaders, who have traveled to D.C. to attend this conference, I want to thank you for being here this week and making the commitment. I want to thank you for the work that you do every day back home. Thank you for taking on the many fights you face at City Hall, the battles that I know you take on in the state legislatures. Oftentimes, thankless work. Oftentimes, not getting the credit for killing bad issues that could damage our members' future. I know your efforts come with great personal sacrifice. I know the toll it takes on your families. But your dedication is really the foundation that makes all of this successful. And your IAFF knows that working together with you is how we get great things done for our members and for our union. 
because of your work, our members continue to increase their political action involvement, and they're running for political office. And with the full weight of IFF and FirePAC behind them, they're winning. Just last October, we supported Local 323 in electing IAFF 6th District Vice President Mike Hurley as the mayor of Burnaby, British Columbia, the second largest city in BC, an incredible victory for our members in Western Canada. That's the good political work. And just two weeks ago, we helped elect three Chicago Local 2 members as city aldermen to the Chicago City Council, one of them taking out an incumbent by nearly 16 points. Congratulations, Jim Tracy and to Local 2's team. Job well done. And tomorrow evening, we hope to celebrate another huge victory when we help elect one of our own, Danny Valenzuela, as the next mayor of America's fifth largest city, Phoenix, Arizona, with the great work of Steve Beerline and his crew at Phoenix Local 493 of this IFF. They're on the ground today. They'll be on the ground tomorrow. And I hope we're going to be celebrating a great victory tomorrow night. We'll continue to stand and invest in fights uh, alongside our locals, like in Houston, Texas, where Marty Langton and our Houston team are in one hell of a fight against a mayor who they initially supported, but who quickly turned around and stabbed our local and members square in the back. And after overwhelmingly winning a ballot measure to give our members the much-deserved pay parity with the cops, that rotten mayor, Sylvester Turner, instead of honoring the vote of the citizens, has resorted to threats of hundreds of firefighter layoffs, not graduating fire recruit classes, and most despicably trying to eliminate the locals' collective bargaining rights, all out of spite. But I know one thing. Local 343 isn't going anywhere, and this IAFF and that local, we don't cower to bullies. We're not going to stop fighting. We're all in on this. We have our members back, and we're not going to play these bullshit games with Turner. We will not back down until he honors and implements the parody our members won fair and square. And this is where I get in trouble off script. And Marty, I know you're here, and I know you're with a great friend from the city council. Welcome to Councilman Boynton, I believe. Thanks for all your support. We got your back, too, brother. Listen while, we, listen, while we fight when we have to, it's just as important to work with our locals and state associations to help them build the relationships and elect our friends to governor's mansions across, all across the country. In states like Illinois, where our endorsed candidate, J.B. Pritzker, unseated a real pain in the ass, Bruce Rauner. And in Wisconsin, electing Tony Evers, a candidate who will work with us in Madison, finally getting rid of that good-for-nothing SOB anti-union Scott Walker. That's the kind of work we're going to continue to do. In Michigan, we'll be helping uh, people like our friend Gretchen Whitmore, who has a long history of supporting firefighters and labor issues, like in New Mexico, helping put our wonderful friend, Michelle Lujan Grissom, into the governor's office, and in Maine, in Nevada, with Jan Janet Mills and Steve Sisolak. These are friends, and these are those that deserve our report, support. But we also support our Republican friends, like Idaho's Governor Brad Little and Maryland's Governor Larry Hogan, who supported our members to pass firefighter-friendly bills, like the PTSI bill in Idaho that is scheduled to be signed tomorrow into law by the governor, and a bill in Maryland to add additional cancers to existing presumption legislation. And we support governors like Mike Parson from Missouri, who will be here with us today who has a great relationship with our leadership there because he understands what it means to be a public servant and votes with that background in mind. And FirePAC wasn't just successful at helping elect governors in November. 
we did a pretty good job across the states, like flipping seven state legislative chambers to a labor-friendly majority, winning nearly 400 seats for our candidates, bring wins that help stop some of the, that bring wins that'll help stop some of the anti-labor legislation that has been a hallmark of legislators more interesting in ending government than in bettering it. And at the federal level, we helped flip the House, adding labor-friendly representatives and putting our friend Nancy Pelosi back into the Speaker's chair. And we expect this new House not just to give us a seat at the table and not just to listen to our voices. We expect them to be full-throated in their support as we start our journey once again to lobby for the enactment of the Public Safety Employer-Employee Cooperation Act so that every IFF member can finally have their working conditions, hours, and wages covered by a collectively bargained contract. That's what they've got to do for us. Knowing that our members retire at an earlier age than the average workforce, uh, we uh, know the vast majority of them have great difficulty in trying to find health care, the health care they need in retirement. Many are put in a position of having to worry that one illness could break their financial back. So that's why we're making a step in the right direction, making it a priority to pass legislation that allows our members to buy into Medicare at age 55, to give our retired members an affordable health care option. And you know we've been focused like a laser beam on the growing concern surrounding behavioral health issues for firefighters and paramedics as a result of their work. And it's a sad truth that too many of our members are battling unseen demons, suffering from post-traumatic stress that tragically is leading to self-harm and taking their own lives at alarming rates. It's truly a tragedy that we have more members dying from suicide than we do from line of duty death. So it's our job to do what we can to make sure we're helping them in every way we can. And that's why we'll be helping them with the legislation known as the Helping Emergency Responders Overcome Legislation, or our HEROES Act, which will address this disturbing trend. It's going to create grant programs for our peer support training. It's going to mandate that government begins to collect the data on public safety officer suicides so we can better understand this epidemic and get our struggling brothers and sisters the help that they need to recover. And for too many citizens, September 11th, 2001 was a long time ago. But to our members who responded to save lives that day, then working on that pile for the weeks and months on end to serve our nation, we don't view it as a long time ago because it continues to bring illness, disease, and death to so many who serve. And unless Congress approves new funding, the money that provides the benefits to those entitled through the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, those funds are going to run out. Or the benefits will be cut by 50 to 70 percent. So we're going to see that Congress makes the fund permanent. We're going to make sure that Congress fully resources it. And we're going to fulfill the promise to protect firefighters and others who responded when our nation needed them. So those in our ranks who answer the call don't have to go to Capitol Hill ever again with hat in hand to beg for help. The benefits and support they've earned, the rights that they should receive, we're going to make sure they receive. By God, that's our mission, and we're going to get to it to see it's done. And occupational illnesses from on-the-job exposures, they're also plag plaguing our sisters and brothers, particularly in the Federal Fire Service. They've been exposed to deadly firefighting foam with high concentrations of known carcinogens during emergency responses, training, even routine maintenance of their rigs. And that's why the IFS, IFF is supporting the bill to provide mandatory testing of Department of Defense firefighters for PFAS 
while we're also going to be calling for the removal of these deadly phones at all DOD facilities. But even more critical is to take on this federal government that is willing to put our members' livelihoods in jeopardy, forcing them to work without pay while this president and this Congress shuts down the government and argues and quibbles over policy. We're not going to stand for that going forward. We cannot stand for that. And for our federal members to be used as pawns in a sickening political game, they deserve what every IFF member deserves, and that's a secure job, fair pay, a decent retirement they've earned, and we're going to be committed to see that they get and keep that. These congressional issues and, and so many more at the local and state level are what our political and legislative program was created to address. So while we focus on our federal government, on all the issues that you'll be here and talking about this week, we're also going to be working with our state associations to expand passage of presumptive cancer and PDSI legislation. We'll be a assisting Dave Noblet and Colorado Springs Local 5 with their collective bargaining referendum on April 2 that I am so convinced will pass and finally put our local at the bargaining table with the city to bargain a contract for our members in Colorado Springs. And we're going to continue to support local ballot measures and tax levies like we have so many, like the most, one of the most recent ones. A 1% tax that Local 4 successfully passed last week in Des Moines, Iowa. A measure that now will hire more firefighters and build more fire stations. Congratulations on great work that Joe Van Halen and his team did on behalf of his members. And we had your back, as you know, Joe. <laughs> we know that when we put our efforts in the powerful IFF brand behind a candidate or issue, the chance of success increases. And that's why starting this year, we are bringing our National Political Training Academy to the state and provincial level to be taught by top National Political Training Academy graduates. We're rolling it out this year to initially partner with about 10 to 15 states. This is so we can build a broader and deeper political capability at the state, but also energize it at the national level. So as we move toward 2020, we'll be better prepared to, to make our presence felt once again. And as we ready our gold and black throughout this country and invest in the campaigns that are important to our members and to our professions at every level of government, we won't just focus on a few high-profile candidates or the campaigns you'll constantly hear about in the news. No. This IFF and our members must be involved in every election that affects us and our ability to protect our members' lives, livelihoods, their working conditions, wages, hours, and their retirement security. And we have to do it from the White House to the U.S. Congress, from the governor's mansions to the state legislative bodies, from the cities and counties to every town hall. Every election matters, and every election has consequences. And it's been throughout our history that we have accomplished great things in the political and legislative arenas. But we can't rest on achievements of the past or just be satisfied simply by what we've already done. We've got to look forward because there is so much more to do. The strength of our union is in our members and in their dedication to get the job done. And as we grow our numbers and our influence, now's the time to push ahead. Every one of us that came to this great profession we call the job, you know what it means to face a challenge? You do it every time that you hop on a rig and head out the door. And we must continue to bring that same strength, that same moxie to our work as this union's leaders. We've made historical progress along the way, but there's more history to make. And we're going to do it together. And we're going to take back more city halls and city councils. We're going to flip more state legislatures and win more governor's mansions. We're going to fill the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives with worker, union-friendly members. And we will see that the White House is occupied by a worker, union-friendly union president of the United States. That's the work that we have ahead of us. And our friends will embrace us, 
and our enemies will know that we are not playing games. We won't stand for political grandstanding, lip service. No photo ops just for a photo op. They'll know we'll be demanding real action. We'll be taking care of business. We'll be making our issues a priority. We'll be holding them accountable. And as we said in the old days, we'll bring money, marbles, and chalk, everything it takes to play the game to win. The stakes are too high for us to do anything but the very best. So let's show the political world once again who we are and what this union brings to the table. Our members deserve it. Each and every one of you deserve it. So let's get to work. God bless you. God bless to all of our members who are on the front lines everywhere.